I think I found very early in life I was fairly good with abstract ideas. I couldn't write, but there was rarely a thing I didn't hear that I couldn't put my mind around and get involved with. So I think I recall being in the 11th grade in high school and able, maybe it was the 12th grade, and able to pick up medieval philosophy, fairly complex questions of essence and being. On one hand, I couldn't write a straight essay about what my bicycle looked like, but I could worry about the angels that danced on the heads of pins and do a fairly good job at that. And when I got to the University of uh, Michigan, I had a marvelous caddy scholarship. I was a caddy for people like Henry Ford and at the very most exclusive club in the upper Midwest, Sarah Firestone and the list of names could be prominent. And I was from a working class family. Uh, it doesn't mean an unintelligent family. It just meant a family that assembled money <laughs> to survive and they worked. And uh, uh, I had uh, verbal grandmothers I had a very teasing grandfather. I had a, a mother who, right or wrong, always had a, a witty way of saying it, and she was clever. And I had a father who was fairly deliberative. And uh, in many ways, a philosopher about what was possible and impossible and what duty was and what duty wasn't. He was, in a certain way, uh, almost Greek, you might say, in terms of setting out the boundaries and knowing what can be done and what can't be done and when you might get in trouble with the gods. He, he had a good sense of that. So I had the sense of uh, words in my family and I had the, the capacity and uh, went to the University of Michigan and discovered fairly quickly that uh, the saying is, man does not live by bread alone, and I would have taken that probably a step further when I was at Michigan, and I would have said, uh, man lives only by words. <laughs> Ideas alone uh, it can allow you to survive. So I thought very seriously about religious matters, and I thought about going in philosophy. There was only one problem. I didn't like technical logic, and Michigan was deep into symbolic logic at that time. I thought about going into uh, labor law. I loved the film on the waterfront, and, 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 but that was just a momentary stir. And then I thought about uh, possibly English. There was only a small problem in the way. I couldn't write. <laughs> So I went to where I was perhaps strongest of all. I had a very good memory for books and words. And memory and talking and understanding the past all fit in my mind. And uh, so I ended up going to what would be a great field of compromise. I went into intellectual or cultural history. And I pursued a secondary teaching degree because I wasn't totally impractical. I needed to make money. <laughs> I wanted to do things like have a family and I needed work. So I went into secondary teaching and I did actually do a couple years of secondary teaching. But meantime in the intellectual or cultural field, without knowing it at the time, but Fairly soon I did know it. I took up the proposition of the great Italian or Neapolitan thinker, Gambatista Vico. And Gambatista Vico puts out an amazing proposition. He said that anything that other people have built, done, reasoned about, argued about, put together, put into law, anything other human beings have done, we have the capacity to modify our own minds so that we can participate in what was done in the past. So the entire past is literally an open book 
to the mind of the person who wants to think about that. And so with that enthusiasm, I became what some would call an intellectual historian. That's the old word. Today they've softened it a little and they call them cultural historians. But in the old days, we would attempt to rethink scientific systems. We'd worry about the foundations of law. Uh, we obviously were concerned with how do you write history? What's the history of history? That was an extremely favorite topic for us. If all crafts and activities have a history, then too, history should have a history, so we wanted to put it together. So that was a, a disposition. I also forever, and then I'm going to Peter at this point, um, conclude this little beginning and leave it up to you to direct me in some new way, but with this uh, disposition to study all things past, there also went on my part a desire to integrate how did the traditions I inherited, be they religious traditions that brought up Roman Catholic, uh, how did the popular cultures of my grandparents, one coming from Sicily, the other from rural Wisconsin. How did this all make sense too? And so I've always had, you might say, a second ear for ethnography or folklore. I was interested in how people do everyday things. And in fact, today, if you're to read through my, say, most recent book of poetry, it's going to be literally be available in a month or so from now. It's called Buoyancies, a ballast master's log. And the ballast master, for those who might not know or are listening, is the fellow who shifts the weights around in the bottom of ships, particularly in the Mediterranean where the seas get very, well, not particularly in the Mediterranean, but in my knowledge of it, it's the Eastern Mediterranean where the Shifts, uh, the uh, waves get very aggressive, and you better have your, your ballast, your, your, what's, what you're hauling, tied down and shifting properly, or you capsize. So I, I very much like the idea we're afloat in the sea. We're a buoyant being, but we do capsize, and it's forever managing the loads within us that it goes with being around. And as you get older, of course, you've got to decide what you can carry and what you have to discard. And if one were to look at this poetry, one would see a certain concern for war, a large, large concern for the history of my own family and the people in my own family, which I've written a lot about. Uh, one would see in there, if they were a reader of that sort of thing, some fairly abstract what they might consider abstract philosophy. Some of it belongs to Aristotle, some of it belongs to Aquinas, some of it belongs to Augustine, some of it belongs to modern, a very contemporary phenomenology. So they'd see a vein of philosophy. They'd see certainly other veins about my wife would be in there, my children and grandchildren would appear in the poetry. And uh, Christ would show up in the poetry, and I also, a fairly avid walker, you'd see uh, a fair amount of uh, scenes, particularly taken by hawks this, <laughs> in this book. Hawks seem to be shadowing the whole book. And, uh, and so that is some of the different themes that I picked up. Why do I do it, or how did I come to do it? Well, it's all of that, and obviously a great deal of indebtedness to very, very fine teachers along the way. I have a sense with this uh, image that the shifting of the ballast around to keep the boat from capsizing is in one way a cultural thing, that it's something you are trying to help people do, students, residents in southwest Minnesota, humanity generally, but also something you're trying to do for yourself. Uh, because it sounds as if philosophy has been a personal concern for you, and history has been a personal concern for you. In a way that it isn't for every historian or every philosopher. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the 
the ballast master job as it relates to your own life and your own intellectual kind of management of this person sailing through a little piece of history? Okay, well, that's a wonderful question. And, uh, and I'll enjoy trying to answer it, like I tried to enjoy, or I did enjoy trying to answer your first question. Uh, we must keep in mind that ballast masters in the Eastern Mediterranean usually were keeping uh, amphorae of wine or olive oil in their proper racks because uh, <coughs> they sloshed around. So uh, uh, that would be one way to go at it. But let me get more to the, your point. One of the activities that traditional people have is keeping memory alive. Keeping memory alive is an obligation. And as an only son of an only son, uh, somebody has to keep the dead alive. And alive could mean thinking about them, it could mean remembering them, or it could mean to a degree revitalizing them with poems, or it could be even following the leads they give you in your daily conversations with them. So in one job the ballast master has is he has to remain true to what has been delivered into the hull of his being. And memory is given over to us to transport across time. In that way, uh, we are abridging. It's not accidental. The small press I run is called Crossings, not crossing, but crossings. Uh, I see a position in being or life. People, being is a bit philosophic, but life isn't. It, we're always crossing things. Sometimes we're crossing between a bad idea and a worse idea. I mean, this, these crossings are not pure. And uh, sometimes they cross difficult seas. But keeping your ship afloat, in part, is keeping your memories in order. And what you remember and how you remember it and your duty to remember it, uh, that emerged, by the way, in this recent book of poetry. Now, with the question of keeping them alive, when you reach the, I guess, I, am I in the seventh decade of my life because I'm 75, or am I in my, the eighth decade of my life because I'm moving towards 80? <laughs> but let's say I'm in the seventh decade. I think the Chinese would count that the other way around, but I don't know about that. Um, there's also the question of how are you remembered, or what do you wish to do to be remembered, or just simply the always deadly thought, you will be forgotten. I mean, uh, the old have to live somewhat with oblivion just around the corner or lurking somewhere. It, it reminds me a little bit about that recent, uh, it's, it happens frequently, but happened very dramatically to the person in Florida. I have a poem about that, by the way, in buoyancies. The person in Florida, uh, heard a giant crash and went from the front of their house to the back of their house to discover their brother, his whole bedroom. All of it had fallen down the sinkhole. And the only thing that was left was, the, I mean, that could be seen, was the edge of his bed, but he and what was the sheeting or all that had just gone maybe 500 feet below wherever Florida ends, which is at the bottom of the ocean. I mean. Talk about buoyancy, Florida can be seen as a ship floating in the ocean of time uh, uh, with the rising seas and the porous limestone below it. So there was this very dramatic uh, fact. And when God asked 
Cain, where is your brother? What's happened to Abel? That's one question. In this question, in this case, the one brother was asking God, looking down this sinkhole, where is my brother? And so life has memory that keeps things afloat. Um, things are not always buoyant. Things do sink. Now, I'll, I, for me, this is not to digress. It's to follow from what I'm saying. Uh, one of the larger concluding poems in the book, and strange, not strangely enough, but while the concluding poem in the book was probably, if any one poem accounted for the origin of the book, it is a poem I told uh, about my uncle. My uncle was a young man, 17, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor with great enthusiasm. He rushed off. He rushed off to uh, join the Navy. My grandfather had Hello. a green, yes. yeah. uh, wonderful 37 Chevrolet. It was forest green. It had a rumble seat. And my grandfather took that car, and we took our family car, and we took my Uncle Bill off to the recruiting station where he was going to be bused to um, bus to begin his military service at Great Lakes, the Naval Center. So off went Bill, only 17, to fight for America. And very quickly he became a medics uh, assistant on the ship and he ended up sailing on a Pass, a, a refurbished passenger ship. And so he went off in the fall in a ship called the Bliss. And the Bliss took him to North Africa where we were just beginning to join the British in fighting Do, uh, Rommel and company. <laughs> and my uncle's ship, along with three other ships, after they discharged their passengers was set at anchor behind, they thought, protective netting to keep the subs out. Well, one German sub, and I've forgotten the name of it, it may be in the poem, I'm not sure, but I do know the name of it in my searches, got behind the netting and sunk all ships, all, all three of the ships. My uncle's ship went down very slowly and agonizingly, and you might say suffered a long death in the evening. Early, er, early after first hit, my uncle went overboard and he took his dead friend overboard with him. His friend was dead already. And he kept the body with him alive. Uh, and he kept the body with him all night. And in the morning, he still had the body and then he was returned to shore, but he never could let that body go. Maybe the body was even paradoxically keeping him afloat. Rather than thinking of him just keeping the body afloat, maybe it was his sole point of friendship in this giant dark ocean lit up only by your own sinking ship. And uh, Bill, that was his name, my Uncle Bill, who taught me to ice skate uh, uh, off the I islands of Detroit in a place called Belle Isle. He was a good ice skater, and I've always had a long attraction to skating over ice, and particularly if it's with racing skates over black ice. To me, skating over black ice has a very, very powerful metaphor, and I used it at the end of the book I wrote on bypass surgery, is that's what we do in life as we skate over black ice. Um, so with that, Bill then continued his service, served in many ways in the Mediterranean, and then returned, married a Lebanese Christian from North Carolina and brought her not back to Detroit, which was his home, where we expected him. Uh, 
He was my mother's only brother, uh, but we wound him back in our family. But no, he went to Boston, actually a town called Malden, uh, just outside Boston. And we went and we picked, uh, uh, we, Bill went and he lived in the apartment of the mother who was now widowed of the dead friend he kept afloat. In other words, from our point of view, he couldn't let the body go. He stayed there for a couple of years at a rather poor job working at the bakery. He'd get up at three in the morning. Anyhow, I was part of the mission to bring Bill back from Malden back to Detroit and, and his wife, the new, newly born child, and I was. And we were always very close after that, my Uncle Bill and I. So as I keep Bill alive in my memory, as Bill kept alive the body floating in the memory, so the ballast master, who is the older ballast master, which I take myself to be the first poem, is called the ballast master. I carry with me memories that I keep afloat. I don't know how long they'll stay afloat. I have obviously more than just sinking ships. I have all these books I've written, all these books I've read, all the I very much belong to that tradition. It's almost like the wax of my candle is what I read. And then because I chew a lot. I, I, if I were a dog, probably I'd be more a dog than a cat. I'd probably chew bones right down to their marrow and then suck on them after that. I, so keep, the ballast master keeps things alive. Uh, and when you give up nations, I mean, if you give up whole nations or you give up institutions or you surrender on the public world, you're still confided to you. And I, I like the word confided. It's not like you just make it up and want this family history, but the family history is confided to you. And when I write, and I'll just finish here, Peter, and then maybe I'll want to go on from there. When I write local history, I've been in southwestern Minnesota for 40 years. 30 of those years, I felt some obligation to give them their own history. It's not that they don't have their own history or they don't make it, but somebody must remain constant to the memory of a place but constant to the memory is just not nostalgia rep nostalgic repetition. It's rekindling the life of what was in the past. And that's where the historian can get fairly critical and fairly analytic, concerned with evidence, the truth he conveys and who he conveys it to. He attempts to bring back to life, but on the best terms, uh, what was in the past. And so, being an historian is somewhat a ballast master and then reaching my age with all the experience I have doubles up on this task of keeping the past alive. Um, I'm struck as you tell your story that you start with some very, you know, kind of general and in some ways sort of standard concerns of intellectual history, talking about the modern period and the medieval period and stuff like that. You know, people, I just talked to someone yesterday who's, who was, uh, her, her boyfriend was doing a history of empires, uh, comparing empires across, across time for Mankato what a thing to do. I mean, what, how much you'd have to have in your head to do that right, and what must the people in Mankato think about it to suddenly be, you know, comparing the Japanese to the British Empire. But, and then there's this local business, this matter of keeping memory alive. You know, your own memories, your family memories, the local memories in southwest Minnesota, um, has that always been part of your uh, agenda, or is has has the local stuff emerged for you? 
uh, the local and personal side of history emerged for you? Um, it's definitely emerged later. Um, my wife Kathy and I were married. We had a few children already. In fact, I think we had all four of our children, so that places me well into my 30s. And it doesn't mean all the time I wasn't thinking about why this grandmother from Sicily did this, or why my grandfather from Wisconsin told the stories he told, or my other grandmother seemed to have the concerns and thoughts that ran through her heads about what she could have been, but what she ended up being. I mean, these things I was very present about. And I had studied with great delight, I studied for a year in French Canada at the Université de Laval, and I was uh, not a vrai Québécois, but I was very attached to French culture. And I had the good fortune, which I didn't know how good the fortune was at that time, but I suspected it was worthwhile, of studying with a man called Luc Le Cossier, who was a great collector of French Canadian folklore. And I learned about the were were werewolf, the Lugaru. I learned about the Cano Volant, that's the flying canoe that brings the log cutters, the Boucheron, back to see their girlfriends during the Christmas season, and they must be careful that they don't fly over a church, or their canoe will be capsized. Once again, we're into the capsized theme, and. Uh, so I had, obviously, types of metaphors roaming around in me, and facts, and curiosities, and things I observed. I mean, you couldn't be an 11-year-old boy from a working-class family that is just, was just coming, really, out of the Depression and World War II, so it had certainly a long way from assembling itself comfortably in mass society with assurance of goods, uh, they couldn't do all of that without some sense of discrepancy, who are my people versus these other people, and then go to the university and hear famous scholars show up, ask them questions and all of that, and ask What's the difference between the way these people talk and my family? I mean, I would have had to have been almost mindless not to have done that. But I'm going to tell or point out the fullest conversion uh, or emergence of my concern for the local or regional. It occurred one day when I received a uh, telephone call. I think it actually came from my mother. And my father had worked uh, at that time uh, 42 years at Western Union. He started as an, he finished high school a couple years early, was an immigrant son, so he brought up three stepsisters and his own sister for a while and supported his grandmother. And so he was a little late getting married, but went to, did go to work when he was 16 at Western Union and worked there for these 42 years, going very high up, eventually even getting into management, heading a union and doing a variety of things along the way. He only missed two days of work in 42 years. A very strong worker. And uh, I could tell all sorts of stories, but they were retiring him, but forced retiring him. Yeah, I think he was about 59, which was obviously three years too early in terms of Social Security. And uh, in effect, they were doing what a lot of older companies do. They push out the people with higher salaries as they trim down and the smaller. And uh, I was an only son, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, and I was stuck with the job. And I say job to give my father's farewell speech, to make some sense of it. And I was going to have it in the audience, 
my relatives, my mother, who certainly would want the company not to fare entirely well in the speech, and at the same time there would be company officials at the speech, and more importantly, not more importantly than family or mother, but more importantly than the company officials, there would be fellow workers at the speech, who somehow or other were being welcomed to a party to let go of my father. Well, I had to give this talk. Eventually, by the way, this talk will have the subtitle, No Gold Watch. That, to me, was the only thing that was relieving. At least the company wasn't going to present him with a watch, which would have been very, I think, a most unwelcome gift, particularly because a watch keeps time. and. <laughs> they were saying he was out of time and all, all that kind of stuff that you couldn't control. But I had to give a talk. And in essence, I had to not make my father look like he was deeply injured. I had to act like I was proud of my father. I had to show a little spleen about the company and what it had done. And I still had to talk about a family tradition that would endure. So the long and short of the talk, which came out pretty good, I think, at least it pleased my mother and my relatives, and I heeded the head of the company who was their representative, I got him a little angry, which was purposeful. And uh, anyhow, uh, the, the, the conclusion of the talk, the theme of it, the very conclusion was, People like us will be working when all kinds of companies have perished and gone away and their names will be forgotten. We belong to the kind of people that endure. Companies with all their frolics and their bravado, they vanish because we're like the donkey. We keep going up and down the trail. Anyhow, that was the argument that we will work and be loyal and the world can go by. So that was a commitment. Now, it was a commitment not to social class. I want to make that clear. I knew Marxism extremely well. I'd read my sources of Karl Marx. I'd read, the, aside from Das Kapital, which is three giant volumes, I'd read so many of his occasional pieces, read his young poetry, read his young essays, knew Hegel's source, knew the other young Hegelians, knew the other first Marxists, knew their rifts and quarrels all the way up to 1900 anyhow, I knew a lot of that stuff. But in no way was I making a class statement. Nor was I making, and this is extremely important from my point of view, I wasn't making an ethnic statement. I was not arguing we are Italian. I was not even willing, and I have never been since, willing to say with any full sincerity we were Sicilian. Rather, we were people from a place on the top of a mountain, pretty high up, almost the top of a set of mountains, the Madania in Sicily. We were mountain people who weren't making it in Sicily. We came to America. My grandfather didn't want anything to do with coal mines, so he came to Detroit. He died very quickly, didn't get a chance to see if he'd make it in the auto industry or not. In other words, and here is the conclusion, I began to want to organize around history where parents and grandparents, and if you wish, later I could talk about the importance of grandparents for local and regional and family historians. But that was the title. Parents and grandparents were all migrants and immigrants. And in this side, I generally elected for my historical point of view to be on the side of the people of the land, who in Europe I knew as peasants. A little, it's a little more problematic in the United States, which begins with capital farming and railroads right off, right off the bat. I mean, that's, that's problematic. It took me a long time to think through that. But uh, basically what became 
the memory of peasants. I wrote from the point of view of local. So it wasn't peasants, again, like some giant class that spread out over time and everywhere the same, but I saw them as people who had locality, closeness to place, but yet were not secure in that place. They were not eternal or enduring. There was not the eternal Sicilian peasant or that kind of thing. So that became a structural way for me to look at society, a way to identify who my family was, and a way to suggest that I belonged to time and change. And that I would be fairly practical and local even though I could talk abstractions. I was still interested in places. Okay, so that, that's some idea. Uh, you left an intriguing trail in that last bit with the mention of grandparents. I want to take you up on that offer, huh? on the importance of grandparents in, in local history. Well, I think grandparents are extremely important. Now, I'm speaking from somebody born in 1938. Uh, I'm not born in 1958 or 1988, much less, I can't speak for the future, those born in 2008. But for me, grandparents uh, were exceptionally important. First, there's a primary way. I knew what my grandparents smelled like. I knew what their closets were like. I knew what their, if they had appliances, I knew what they were like. I knew what their floors of their house were like. I heard their stories. I knew if they drank, what they drank. Uh, I what received a bodily impression. I knew how one grandparent prayed before he went to sleep. I knew, I mean, I, mean, I knew details. And so on the surface, my grandparents aren't some abstraction I'm following in the past. They're embodied people of flesh, habit, mind, personality, a variety of things. Contradictions, confusions. <laughs> hopes, desperations, disappointments, sorrows. So I know them as a chunk of being given to me. And guess what? They also, by the nature when they're born, roughly 50 years before me, they take me back into a world as I reconstruct them I end up reconstructing their childhood. So I know them, but I don't know who they were when they were children, what their families were like, who they were like, but I have real traces. I'm not like a detective just looking for one scant clue. I pretty well have a good idea of what their size was like, what their skin was like, all the things I mentioned. I know what their stories were how they even talked about their own childhood. So I have this tremendous thing. Now, what is extremely powerful about grandparents for me to add one additional note is grandparents, in my case, took me back, not to the pre-industrial world, but in Sicily they did. My, my grandmother, this was pre-industrial. There was this, Industry maybe had come to the shores of Sicily, but had not gone up those mountains. There weren't even good trails up and down those mountains. So I had to say, and my grandparents from Wisconsin, they took me into the period of American history of the 1890s, 1880s in rural Wisconsin. A period was just coming out of the Civil War, period where immigrants were all over the place, Irish immigrants, their mother were Prussian immigrants, and on my grandmother's side, on my mother's side, they were ultimately French Acadians. And all of a sudden I discover, here's a family that came from French Canada, 
evicted by the English in 1755, got there in 1640 in Nova Scotia. And their entire history eventually I learned where they went, how they came, and how they ended up in Wisconsin. So grandparents were, uh, let me just chose a completely different metaphor. Grandparents are diving boards on which I could bounce and spring and plunge into the past with ample bounce in the board. So there, you, you could even, with the extension of metaphor, Peter, sort of see the buoyancy theme in those last sentences I gave to him. Um, I'm struck with your mention of Detroit. Uh, the news from De Detroit these days is, to put it very mildly, not good. <laughs> uh, it feels like a third world country as you read about what's happening there. And I guess I, I'm interested in your reflections as a person from Detroit, also as an historian, on this strange thing that has happened to this American city. Well, 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 well. If I uh, can get up for a second, I could conclude my comments with a poem I wrote to Detroit. Oh, just please. So I'll just say a few things about Detroit and then read the poem. Great. I, I'd like to give this, so this may be heard not very far, but I'd like this to be heard. First off, Detroit is not altogether unique. Uh, it in some way mirrors the industrial world everywhere, be it Glasgow, in the 19, Glasgow, Scotland in the 1960s. I'm sure I could find sections of Manchester, England that registered this. No number of countries, uh, but in, in the United States, there's a little bit of D Detroit and Chicago. There's a lot of Detroit and Cleveland or Buffalo. Uh, so on one hand, it's an industrial story. On the other hand, it's a particularly American story, uh, Detroit, particularly American, because it's got two stories in it. One is Detroit's the center of the automobile, and so it marches in step with the automobile and the supporting industries, tires being just the most obvious example. In, automobiles are not a single industry, but they're, they're, they drag so much. So, a person must understand the second thing about Detroit, aside from the auto story. Detroit equipped America to fight World War I, probably more than any place. In World War II, Detroit supplied the tanks, the jeeps, the metalwork. Its whole industry, its whole industry from top to bottom was put in service of America fighting World War II. To this day, I don't know how many tanks or yet trucks my grandfather or a few of my uncles who weren't drafted, they were tool and die makers or so on, made for the Russians. I mean, I, I mean, we were just a great supply center for that war. So that's point two. Point three, as a great industrial center that paid better wages and had a higher per capita income in almost any place in America in the 1920s and even into the 50s, we of course attracted workers from the South. And a great number of them were black workers and there's books now that are beginning to catch this migration story. And they're catching it actually starting in World War I. So if a person were to study Detroit rather than just listen to the everyday news, one would simply look at the demography of Detroit, number one. Who lived there? What numbers did they come in and what percentage did they come? Number two, they would look at the question of employment over that period. Number three, they would 
look at what happens to people when they concentrate, huddle, and they're unemployed, and then they become dependent on government. They try to Perfect story that way. If you looked at the, uh, just take black population. I've not dealt with uh, rural Canadians coming in, other rural Midwesterners coming in. You might say fresh off the farm, or great numbers of, uh, if we want to call them whites or regional people from Tennessee, Kentucky, Southern Ohio. They filled up Detroit. Detroit was a great magnet. And then after World War II. Detroit couldn't expand anymore. It didn't go into airplanes. Henry Ford wanted them to. There was nowhere to go on the suburbs. Meantime, the housing stock was getting older in Detroit. I mean, just the housing stock. I'm not trying to talk about crime yet or that. Just the plain houses. The houses were set up and lived in for 60 years by new immigrants. They were flat. They didn't represent the better housing. Better housing advancement lived away from the center of Detroit. So all that added up. And you got more and more unemployed people, single family people, no work, and the stores no longer could make it, the stores could no longer be safe, and Detroit rotted from the center out with no way to annex new land. And then I won't describe, I'll leave that for others, if I were giving a talk, I might not do too badly at it, but I think others would do much better because I went away really when I'm 25, so a lot of my knowledge is based on only biannual trips back to Detroit. But of course, I talk to people on the phone and all that. Uh, Detroit rotted from the center out, uh, the center out, rotted, and I mean rotted by crime, rotted by housing, rotted by public policy, uh, rotted because it couldn't furnish jobs. And, 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 and to use the word, but not to give it uh, all the simple phraseology that would be given in Minnesota that probably now given North Minneapolis and some other places and parts of St. Paul <laughs> is not feeling quite as invulnerable as it did. But it's not just that somehow or other people in Detroit were racist and that caused the whole thing. I mean, that is uh, something I want to say. But Detroit is... Uh, it's, it's when you knew it as a boy, it had more trees, greatest waterworks. Uh, it was a lovely city, great parks, great island where you'd go to in the 50s. It was, it was a dynamic, growing city, good baseball. And I have to point out for the listener, in 1935, there was a boxer named Joe Lewis who wasn't bad. There was a team called the Detroit Lions that even won back then, the Detroit Tigers, the Red Wings. I mean, Detroit had a great art museum, as, uh, as they now think with the bankruptcy. There's a, I think the art museum is estimated at two billion or a billion and a half in artworks. And Detroit had a good, very good symphony. It had, and so all in all, Detroit went high, but from 50, 55 down, from 55 onward, anyone who can read demography would read decline. It, it's like when I studied southwestern Minnesota, I wrote a book called The Decline of Rural Minnesota. Anyone who could read numbers could see the decline was steady out there, too. Very interestingly, from 50 on, the population decline was steady. And if you could read the numbers, in other words, get the censuses, the different censuses out and read them at 10-year periods looking for different factors, you could see decline in the works. And so what a lot of people are seeing is kind of like a, the bottom after the rocket took off. <laughs> they're seeing all the spent fuel and they're seeing all the burnt grass and Detroit kind of blew up. If I could step over, I'd read yeah, your poem. I'd, I'd like that, please. Okay.
This should do it. Can I start? This is called, probably fittingly given what's been said so far, this is called a trip to a Detroit cemetery. I wedge the door tight with the furniture of memory, especially my father's reading chair when I visit my native Detroit when I visit, and then I go on, uh, I'll read just a little bit of this here, okay. When I visit my native Detroit, but I cannot close the drafty cracks that run the threshold of my mind with rags and blankets of old stories. Winds, times prying and fingering thieves, Enter my childhood and tear out sheaves of its book. They spin up in whirlpools like autumn's gathered leaves. They float them across seasons over the bl high black wrought iron fence of Mount Olivet Cemetery, where my parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles lie, scarcely remembered under submerged flat stones the leaves, like migrating butterflies, cluster and cross the east side. Between the spokes of Gratiot and Jefferson Avenue, descending on the blocks that lined and grid the palms of my mind, the leaves settle. In vacant yards and unintended lots where old immigrant houses once stood, blank and white, camouflaged among pet patches of retreating snow. They whisper nothing on this gray spring day to charred houses and passing figures from behind pieced together rusty fences, mangy dogs that sleep in the empty hulls of discarded cars, and the shadows of vacated premises bark they sense apparitions, old ethnic foreigners like Cecilia and me, of Etna's ilk, who persisted in remembering an arcing, sparking, arsenal, steel-making cities and rivers of burning, running embers. And that's the poem on Detroit. So. New topic, maybe. Uh, this is just a, a guess. Uh, in the article on your your life in Wikipedia, I, you're listed someplace like that. You're listed as of the, the you know the, the founding faculty member of the history department at Southwest State University. Now, remember when Southwest State University emerged, uh -huh. and everyone was excited because. It had all kinds of gadgets that other universities didn't have. Mm -hmm. It was the newest thing in the world. And I, you know, I've, I've gotten interested over the years in what it means for there to be colleges and universities in rural Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, especially as people start to say, well, it'd be a lot more convenient to just concentrate everything in Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm thinking that it's a sort of metaphysical thing to have been the founding person for the history department for a new university in southwest Minnesota. And I'm curious how you think about what was, what was happening there. No, oh, well, that could be an entirely different interview, and one that I could be more, a little more joyous. This has been a bit on the dark yeah. side with cemeteries and all that, but it was great fun to be a founder with a few friends. Uh, in the simplest terms, other people at universities talk about what they do, or they talk about who's running them, or they talk about plans they have for the future, or, any number of things that are quite worthy of talking about. But at Southwest, we don't talk about what the school is. We talk about what we made. 
And in a way, it takes you back to the Vico theory. It's not some abstract thing you think. It's what you remember doing <laughs> that goes with Southwest. And there's an ecstasy in creating because we created the first full functional uh, teachers union at higher ed in the state. That meant battle royals. We helped get presidents, the presidency of Southwest, and we took away presidencies and vice presidencies. We designed curriculum for history and did, by the way, dedicate our curriculum to studying our own region and park with new seminars. We, uh, at the same time, we helped invent social science and the social science curriculum. And with a handful of friends, I never did anything alone, but there was a, like an intimate, almost like a three musketeer relationship there, but maybe at times there were seven musketeers, at the time there were two of us, but uh, we did all sorts of things. And one of the things we did is create the whole idea of rural, regional, and local studies as a part of the curriculum and then as a place that book, produced books on our region, as a place that said, and unfortunately I don't think it said nearly strong enough, that local universities shouldn't be local. By goodness, they should be cosmopolitan, but they should also be rooted in where they are, and they should be the center of understanding where they actually are. Because if the university can't tell you where you are, I mean, they can tell you where New York is, <laughs> but you're in Bemidji, and you can go there, or Southwest, or Winona, and I could go on. But if I can go to one of those places, and they can tell me about China, or they can tell me about tribes in Africa, or they can tell me about Mongolians in different parts of Russia, but they can't tell me the history, and I mean the deep history of the, the Bemidji. I don't mean just a set of cliches, but they can't really teach me anything. Isn't that a bizarre thing? And what, how do they justify over the long term their place? How do you justify being somewhere, claiming you're articulate, claiming you have a important role there, but you don't know it. So you're in southwest Minnesota and you don't know what a slew is. <laughs> Somebody describes a hog operation, and I, I'm not saying you have to be out there slopping hogs in the morning. They have no idea what goes on in one of those places. Somebody's in a small town and wondering if they can keep their coffee shop going, and you don't instinctively know all the dimensions, times involved. Or a husband and wife tell you that they're averaging 100 miles a day on their two vehicles, and you don't grasp immediately what that means. Maybe you aren't where you think you are. And if you're not where you think you are, so when you're talking about, I gotta stay here, I gotta get out of here, you're not even talking about staying or getting out of here, you're talking shadow talk. Uh, you're rather empty then if you're talking about things that don't have substance. And so that was, uh, I mean, I could go on at great length on this and give sermons even on this one, but without places, what do we have to say about most social things? And that, by the way, is what I would take most commentary to be. Uh, why it's so useless, most news. They don't tell me where I am or who's, who the people are that are there. They deal with not even analytic abstractions, they just simply shift around vague abstractions that they can't even put the numbers to. And, and it's like a discourse of hollow people about empty things. That was a sermon, sorry. I apologize for the sermon. <laughs>
and do sermons all day as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much. You're welcome.